Yo, thank you for tuning back in. I'm that dude over there, and I'm seeing if it's possible to beat Fire Emblem the Blazing Sword with only 5 units. Last time I covered the first 19 chapters of the game using 4 of my 5 members of my roster. Today we'll go over the last 13 chapters and see if I was able to clear the challenge. If you like what you see, please remember to share the video around as it's a great help for me who's a complete idiot. With all that out of the way, let's move on to our deep dive into... Chapter 20. Okay, first difference I noticed between normal and hard was how many unpromoted bishops appeared and surrounded Merlinus. It was ridiculous. However, this chapter marks my first reset to the run thanks to a reckless strategy of having Eliwood show off his rapier to multiple lance units. Attempt 2 goes a lot smoother now that I have some experience of hard mode under my belt. However, it's here where I'll have to acknowledge one criticism I'll get with the run. Doing all that I can without cheating, I wanted to build up some supplies in the convoy. To do this, however, I began a scummy move where I arena abused the game for profit. For context, arena abusing is the action of re-rolling the arena into battles where we win, and then be healed by a nearby healer. So long as you have about 500 gold, you can use the arena and you can get a bunch of gold and experience in return. However, I did this all with Hector and Eliwood after they had already reached level 20, and didn't get any more gold than necessary. Listen, I want to exploit the game, I don't want to ruin it. If anyone wants to do this challenge without this coming action, go ahead and try. I won't fight the criticism, I just want to see more challenges like this be spread around. I just knew it would be a little bit easier for me going forward. Chapter 21 Another defense chapter, but this time we're defending Niels, who is suffering from chronic sleep deprivation. We watch as an enemy dual-toned haired wyvern rider meets the sharp end of Hector's axe and watch his old ally suffer from enemy overflow and collapse to the pressure. Chapter 22 Finally, we witness the pure power of Pent, our final unit, but on the side of a self-sacrificing greenie. Our gang rush over to aid Pam, recruiting a homeless man who takes hits for the team in these trying times. After saving the magic general of Etruvia, Pam guides us to an old man who has lived a long time thanks to his connection to the weapon magical weapon triangle. He offers Lynn some of his drops before sending the trio on their way to burn to find the Fire Emblem. Yes, that's right, it's the name of the game. The Fire Emblem exists in all versions of the game, but takes the shape of many different things. In the most recent games, not including uh, Engage, it's a magical power that has a chance to heal the protagonist. In this game, it's a national treasure of the nation of Burn. Chapter 23 In FE7, there's a rut split that takes place based on the levels of certain characters. The first one takes place here, where if our lords are level 49 and under, we face off against Void, the Swordmaster of the Black Bang. However, because our levels capped off like, what, five chapters ago, we instead fight Linus, the hero of the Black Fang. It's here we face our second reset, where I can't learn my damn lesson about sending fragile Swordlocks units against a horde of wyverns. However, this time, Lynn bites the bullet, since she wasn't fast enough to dodge their attacks. It's about here where I need to start explaining the support system in early Fire Emblem games. You see, in modern Fire Emblem games, you can have basically anyone support with anybody. Everyone is given a support, blah blah blah, and you can support with these units as many times as you want. However, in early Fire Emblem games, you were given a maximum of five supports with any character. And I'm just, and I'm not saying like, oh, five people with maximum supports. No, no, no. I'm saying. The maximum rank you can have is 1 A rank, and 1 B rank, or 5 C ranks. Or, you know, any combination in between. To further complicate this, each unit is also given a random affinity that gives different stat increases. The higher bond between ranks, the stronger the stat increase. Uh, there are great affinities, like fire or anima, and then there are bad affinities, like Ice and Wind. Now with that said, 
Thunder is a really great affinity, as it provides a great boost to critical hits and general evasion. Hector is a great unit with the Thunder affinity, and thanks to Sarah, he can receive the benefits he bestows on the others, like Elliwood. This chapter, I spent time building the supports up since we're approaching the end of the game. Chapter 24 Pank finally joins the squad with his wife-to-be Louise, who brings with them a Heaven Seal. A Heaven Seal allows our lords to promote, and depending on whose route you take, either Elliwood or Hecker will promote last because of story. I decided to promote Lynn with the first seal, as the two candidates are either her or Hector. Since Hector is already a great unit, there wouldn't be any benefit for him promoting in the short term. Lynn, however, is already bordering on being a useless unit thanks to her low offense and defense. So after ironically losing our first run because of some more wyverns that target Lindis, we sock off Hawkeye as we buy more Elfires from Penn. As the chapter comes to a close, an enemy commander with a terrifyingly strong spear leaves the Truia to reunite with the Black Fang. Chapter 25, the other route split chapter. This time, based on whether Sarah was stronger than her dead comrades, we face off against a bishop named Kenneth and recruit a strong warrior named Harkin, only to prevent him from wrecking our five guys with a dream. Right? Good. Chapter 26. This chapter is a prominent roadblock for most players, especially those who want to recruit every character without them dying. This is a fog of war map, where you need to defend a young King Zephiel from Black Fang assassins who want him dead. You get two allies to recruit as former Black Fang assassins, and if they can reconnect, you get access to a guiding chapter where you can obtain the only fell contract in the game outside of a secret shop. However, if one were to recruit either of them, a Black Fang assassin known as Ursula will begin to approach a player, smiting them from range with her bolting tone. Meanwhile, you start far away from Zephiel and must navigate through the twisting corridors quickly before he gets surrounded by dark mages or worse, a promoted unit. God. I'm not gonna lie, I was sweating a bit, but I had a plan. Last chapter, we received a purse tone from defeating a bishop. It was probably Kenneth, but I don't remember. But the plan is to blitz towards Zephiel with the gang while Sarah defends him with the purse tone until they can arrive. The first attempt goes well, at first, but we end up getting Zephiel killed to a promoted hero with a steel sword. Attempt 2, we're able to get to Zephiel much faster, create a barricade using Hector's defense and swapping in and out Lynn and Alleywood, and using Pent and Sarah to heal the gang when they get their HP low. It worked. After the chapter, Ursula gets stabbed in the back by Lynn Stella, another of the Black Fang, Hector gets a promotion for his excellent defense. Chapter 27 Attempting to secure weapons to fight against the Black Fang, we arrive at the Shrine of Seals, only to see it's being blocked off against the other brother we haven't killed yet. In our case, it's Lloyd. I knew the Wyvern commander from before returns this chapter, so I left Elliewood behind a recruiter, while Lynn, Hector, and Penn take care of the masses. We also find a village that holds the greatest weapon in Fire Emblem history. The Warp Staff. As the name implies, it's a staff that warps a unit to another tile. And after buying some tomes for Sarah and Penn, we attempt to surround Lloyd for victory, when Vida finally arrives. Elliwood reasons with Vida, however, the weapons that accompany her don't become green units. Yeah, I thought they would just leave us alone and fly away, but no, they're out for blood. Hollywood gets destroyed. So, like all chapters before, attempt number two, we succeed by recruiting Vita to the Great Bench of the Sky with Hector's axe and draining Lloyd's light brain of uses with Sarah before sending him to his brother with Lynn. We obtain an iron rune for Hollywood to block critical hits, but because of the slower plays we made, we lost out on the warp staff. As the chapter comes to a close, Elliwood finally promotes to horseplay, and Nurgle kidnaps Ninian again for the dragon gig. Fan tucking bastard. Chapter 28. Fairly easy chapter. Only Elliwood, Lynn, Hector, and I are able to enter the sealed shrine 
to retrieve Durandal and some other weapons from the graves of previous heroes. However, as we leave, we are attacked by an ice dragon that seemingly comes out of nowhere. Durandal's PTSD forces Eliwood to cut down the dragon to protect everyone. However, the ice dragon is revealed to be Ninian! Nurgle explains that while Ninian had become a dragon again, she had remembered her love for Eliwood. Oh god, this sounds like a tragic love story. But Eliwood has no connection with Ninian throughout this entire conquest. So his attempts to trigger Eliwood fall on deaf ears. Athos attempts to smite Nurgle for the, his crimes, but Thorblaze doesn't even scratch the man, who flees again to bring about more dragons. Chapter 29. Another defend map as we protect Ostia from the dra Black Fang. Surprisingly, we don't have to reset the chapter this time around, but we use this opportunity to maximize our supports with Hector, Eliwood, and Lynn. Our final results end up with Hector marrying Sarah with their A-Ring support, and Hector remaining good friends with Eliwood with their combined B support. Oh, and Eliwood marrying Lynn to provide her with stat boosts. Chapter 29X Holy crap! This is the only guiding chapter we're going to get? Aw, oh, man. Oh well. We need to prepare for our final assault on the Dread Isle where the Dragon Gate lies. Ostia provides us with 10,000 gold, and there are tons of shops with great equipment. Here, we buy some weapon triangle, reverse weapons, and killer weapons for the lords. Oh, killer weapons basically uh, increase the crit rate, however they have low usage. Then we buy some Elfire and Divine Tones for Sarah and Pen. And before the final turn, we pick up some pure waters to raise the resistance of our lords just in case. These waters will sit in the convoy. Chapter 30. We barge into the Dread Isle and Lim Stella attempts to block our path. Nils offers an Earth Seal before the battle. And to those who don't know, an Earth Seal allows any unit to promote so long as they're above level 10, similar to a Master Seal from Awakening. However, because all of our playable units are already promoted, this is worthless, and I drop it as he gives it to me. Here, we sack off all our units that we're not using, and that were just sitting on the bench until this point. Those units consisted of Matthew the Thief, Harkin the Hero, and Nils the Bard. However, despite taking a spear to the chest, Nils stays alive thanks to the power of determination. We have to replay this map as, surprisingly, Pent dies from the enemy surrounding us. But despite this little hiccup, we defeat Lumstella and give the Pimble Venter Tome they had to Pent. Finale. Fight. Before starting the last chapter, I needed to organize our final equipment for the fight, since our Linus doesn't follow us into the Dragon's Chamber. Athos arrives to aid us in the defeat of Nurgle, and delivers Durandal, Armads, and Sokati to the wards. However, the wards rob him of his goods and force him, along with Louise, to hold all their equipment. Uh, who's Louise? Ah, oh, sh- Alright, listen. I needed Penn to have some kind of support for the final map, and Louise is an automatic A rank. I'm sure if I googled it, it, I would find Pent had support with some of the others, but I didn't have the time nor the effort to pay attention, alright? So shut up. So after supplying the wards, Sarah and Pent, with their equipment, we enter the final map of the Blazing Sword. The first part of this map has our gang defeat a boss rush against the fallen bosses we've defeated throughout the run. After defeating them, we need to defeat Nurgle, who has a tremendously high damage output. And this part of the chapter took me four attempts to complete, as I kept for Gang to give Sword Reaver to Hector to go against Void and Linus. Because I didn't give Hector Sword Reaver, by the way, Lloyd would indefinitely kill Eliwood or Pent because of their low speed or defense. And now, finally, part two of the chapter. This has our team go up against the real final boss. A, it's a, it's a fire dragon? 
Okay, listen, I know I sound anticlimactic about this, but Roy has to fight these guys as common enemies, alright? And they aren't nearly as good as this guy. Alright, so listen, the problem with the dragon is that it has really high offense and HP. Well, it has high stats all around. Its attack range is 1-3, so I can't rely on Hector's supports, as Elliewood and Sarah basically get one shot by this thing, and the supports I need to be 1-2 range in. So, not only this, but Hector is the only one who can reasonably hit this thing. Light magic sucks and doesn't dent the fire dragon scales. Elliewood gets doubled and doesn't survive the second hit. Pent doesn't deal anything because he can't access four blaze, and the tome you get in the map prior, Excalibur, does no damage. The only other person to survive to hit this thing is surprisingly Lynn. But she only does 5 damage with her Sulcati. Give it a round of applause, people. This is our lord. Hector, on the flip side, does 26 damage with Armad, but has to retreat every other turn to ensure he doesn't die. This part took me 2 attempts, and it was thanks to the god strength of Hector that we were finally able to smite the fire dragon and save a leave from the second coming of dragons. So, yeah, that was a run. I was concerned that I wasn't going to complete this run, mostly because of the fire dragon. But who knew all I needed to kill it was our lord and savior, Hector. Not only that, but recording this thing actually sucks as I kept stumbling and fumbling my words. But, you know, it's a lot easier than my current Pokemon method, so, you know, maybe I'll do that instead of whatever it is I'm doing there. I really enjoyed this run, and I would love to see how people try and do this run, outside of me who, you know, fly, cheat, and steal to get to the end. Uh, and who knows, if this video gets any attention, I'll see if it's possible to do it with other Fire Emblem games. I mean, surely it's not that much of a challenge. Maybe I'll do Radiant Dawn next. Who knows? Uh, I hope you enjoyed the video. And from one stranger to another, stay safe out there.